Dr. Glass, you're in a incredibly opulent room, a fireplace crackling in the corner. It's not one of yours. It's one of your clients. You see them sitting in a chair by the window. They turn to you and they ask, So, how long will you be gone to Crow Perch? Are we not going to be having sessions anymore? I'm afraid I might indeed be gone a few months. I have research to do at Blackthorn University. Uh, We should be able to write to each other if there's anything urgent. Uh, I would encourage it, in fact. I'd encourage you to uh, write to me any thoughts you might have, any dreams you might have. I am an avid correspondent. But uh, the research for my upcoming book, uh, this is a rare opportunity, you know. Uh, Very few people, very few outsiders are uh, admitted to Blackthorn University, even on a temporary basis. Interesting. I've been to Crow Perch before. It's... Well, I'm just not much a fan of the politics. Are you familiar with the families? Well, there's the Scalders, the Vanthorns, the Meridials. It's not the same world we live in here. It's... They're the powers that be. I actually haven't been uh, since I was a little girl. You know, it used to be quite the vacation spot. Not so much anymore, I understand. Uh, So... Please tell me more. I'd love to be prepared so I don't uh, step in it, as they say. I know you're a well-connected man. The Van Thorns killed my wife. Oh. I... We've never quite gotten into that territory in detail before. That's because I haven't told you. You have to know, it's not like any other city where there's guards and tribunals and courts. You should be aware what you're walking into. Why did they kill your wife, Arthur? Well... And she goes up to him and just looks into his eyes and puts a hand on his wrist. It's all right, Arthur. You can tell me. She invested my inheritance, much of it, into the mines and she discovered a way to to get more product faster than the rest of the families they killed her and took her technology and then they sent me out back home so purely because she was too adept at being their competition they will do anything to stay in power the Van Thorns, they're not like the other families that come from Kieran Stone and Samarouch, Varanos. They came out of nowhere, but I tend to think that they're so successful above the rest because of their cruelty. That is often the way. It's very brave of you to tell me this, and it sheds light on some of the dreams you've shared with me. He looks out the window and starts to don his thousand-mile stare as you know this sensation. The last few minutes of his life are probably washing away from his brain, as they typically do, just constantly forgetting. Oh, Doctor, I had a fantastic dream last night. Uh, That's wonderful, Arthur. I'm so glad... Would you like to tell me about it? Yes. Me and my wife were enjoying some time on the beach together. The servants brought us some drinks, and I i always remember how beautiful she was. Do you remember anything about the beach? Yes. You see his expression start to change. A furrow in his brow. There was... blood on the sand and everybody was laying down 
face down in the sand. My wife, she had a sword through her chest. You see terror start to dilate his pupils. And he looks out the window again. All right. Lie, that's enough for now. Why don't you lie down on the chaise here and sleep, Arthur. This has been too much for the moment. And she says a few words in some other language. And he falls asleep. And she looks around the room, concerned. There's a, a crease of worry and care on her forehead. This is one of the ones who's who's gotten to her a bit. Uh, but she takes a few notes in Thrum Called and resolves that she will write to him. Uh, he's an ideal correspondent as he likely won't remember writing to her after all. You open your eyes. The room is hot. The window, you can't really see anything out of it. It's just white. And you're startled a bit for just a moment because you hear the fan come on again, blowing just a little bit more clean air into the room. But the rooms are hot. The body heat radiating. This ill-timed journey of the ship was met with the saturation, which usually arrives later on this year, but nonetheless, it's here early. The air is thick with salt, dense and corrosive, a mist that could fill your lungs in just one breath. Of course, less fortunate ships who were caught out by this, you can only assume, have already vanished under the weight of the salt deposits, dragging them down below the water in crystalline tombs. Yet, her royal rose, this ancient vessel, is designed to endure the saturation for a limited time. Maybe less than a day. But it's already been two days traveling, with a couple more to go until you reach... Port Hillcrest. Beneath the deck, you can hear the yelling, fighting, discomfort sounds of the entire common quarters. It comes through the floors. It's been like this day and night for the last two days. Confined like caged animals, the passengers have no choice but to place their faith in this ship's faltering heartbeat. The fluttering of ribbons on the vents in your rooms are the only sign that you'll survive this trip, and even they cut on and off occasionally. Every few minutes, you see the ribbons go down and then kick back up again. All right, Trev. Latch on the door's fucked. Pick up that crate with me and we'll get it in front of the door. Oh, uh, yeah, sure, I got you. Uh, let me get under it real quick. I'll go and attempt to help. Roll an athletics check. Okay. Uh, that's a 13. You pick up the crate with assistance. This one's quite heavy. Probably will make good use in front of the door. And the two of you are able to get it over and pin the door closed. Fuck. I'm so tired. Anyway, thanks, Trev. Look, uh, you can take a break. Um, I'm going to go grab lunch, and I think... The the errands today are getting close to an end. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, no worries. Just, you know, call me if you need me. Uh, I should probably head back down and see, you know, what my boss needs next. Um, yeah, uh, take her easy. You got it. And Ken, he turns and gives you a little half-hearted salute and walks down to the cruise quarters. Just kind of kind of brush himself off, uh, making sure to pat his uh, jacket pocket, making sure that 
his precious cargo is still there and just looks around. I'm sure it'll be fine. He just kind of mutters to himself. And he's going to just slowly start to make his way back uh, to Dr. Glass and Nihilus's cabin just to see if he gets stopped or anything. But if not, he's just going to head all the way there. You head down the hall and Dr. Glass and Nihilus inside the room sweat beads from your brow the air filter off for just a little bit longer this time than last kicks back on again and there's a knock at the door Dr. Glass tenses I think after three days of uh, territorial display Dr. Glass is probably at the writing desk Indeed. She shares, but... They would have to share, indeed, but this is a particular day that Nihilus has not fallen himself into shoving the conversation into perspective as he is sitting on the bed with his hands around his own neck at the back looking up to the ceiling, watching the fans spin and just thinking, sometimes a little bit out loud. As he hears a knock, he says, Well, who is it? Mm -hmm. Uh, more investigation? No, it's it's me. It's Trevor. Hey, <laughs> want to open up? The door is open. Please come in. Not sure how Doctor Glass feels, but for me, there's no need to knock. You're most certainly welcome here. With all due respect. Why is the door open, Nihilus? And she, uh, her shadowy magic hand which Nihilus by now is acquainted with, turns the knob and opens the door to let Trevor in, but she whips around on Nihilus and says, the door should be locked, and of course, Trevor, of course you're welcome, but of course you should knock. Dr. Glass, we talked about this. It, sometimes people would need assistance or help, especially with the, the saturation happening as it already is. Who knows? With all due respect, uh, Mr. Von Stone in... Um, that points over at the doctor. That is why I knock. Kind of slinking his way into the room, closing the door behind him. Is just going to take a seat, uh, perhaps on, on one of the beds, probably not Nihilus's. And is just going to kind of crouched over, elbows on his knees, look up and go, I had a busy day. Uh, apparently, uh, they were looking to get something from me, but, uh, weren't keeping that much of an eye on me. Managed to get down here. Uh, I suppose I just blended in with the workers. I kind of have that vibe. So, uh, just do a little bit of that, and, uh, I don't know if I'm out of the woods yet, but, uh, here's hoping. <laughs> Uh, and as he's kind of rambling, he kind of starts to notice the uh, doctor at her desk. Just kind of go, So, anything happened while I was gone? Not particularly. At all. I was thinking of, like, with the heat rising as it is, it was an interesting tale that was told to me as I was patching up uh, a most brave soldier back in Cairnstone. He had recently come back and he needed attending to. He had a very interesting tale as he came back from the lands of Samarouch. Over there, there was this group of nomads stemmed down from who knows where in the mountains of the Dragon Rises. And they learned that how to traverse the tremendous heats of the mountains themselves they simply meditated their way through, which seemed like a fascinating thought to me. How one could control their own calmness of mind to have such a large impact on one's well-being for just easy things as heat. I must say, I'm trying the method right now, and it does not work at all. <laughs> <laughs> well... 
that is, uh, as you said, uh, fascinating. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, you're talking about meditating. That's pretty simple, right? Meditating to a certain degree that one might inject their own comes of mind into reducing their own bodily temperature to withstand even the most impermediate of heats. Hmm. I mean, that's not unheard of. I can do stuff like that. I mean, not exactly like that, but like being able to center yourself, being able to like calm your emotions and focus on the willpower over what's normally physically possible. I wouldn't be surprised if someone can cool themselves down to, you know, survive the intense heat. Uh, There was this lady I talked to uh, years ago. She was just this little thing. Uh, Taught me all about, you know, centering my emotions. Uh, It was all a lot of, like, mysticism and hullabaloo. But, like, a lot of it really worked. I mean, I sparred with her, and she was just this little, like, two-foot thing. And she kicked my ass, so... (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Through that kind of stuff, a lot of stuff is very much possible. Trevor, I had no idea you had experience with mysticism and hullabaloo. That's fascinating. Uh, They kind of gave me a crash course on this. Uh, It's really... I didn't have a lot of proficiency with swinging a sword, and for a mercenary, that was kind of what you needed to do. Uh, But when I got transferred over to her, she kind of showed me how I can protect myself without resorting to weapons. Uh, Like I said, mind over matter kind of stuff. Uh, It really does help. Yes, indeed. Yes, people are often surprised to find that apparently weak or frail bodies can house minds capable of violence. (laughs) Quite literal violence. Not just the pen is mightier than the sword type. The mind can crack your skull type things. I know that. Uh, Hmm. You see, uh, Trevor actually gets quieter uh, when you say that. Um, Can I can I ask you a favor, Doctor? And she sits up a little bit and she speaks into his mind. She says, Always, Trevor. Just so you know, you can speak to me this way now as well. As long as we're in sight of each other. See, as soon as that happens, he kind of, his fingers kind of twitch a little bit. And she says out loud very quickly, Yes, Trevor, anything. Doctor, don't ever talk inside my mind ever again. Does he say that out loud? Out loud. A remarkable feat to hear indeed. And quite spontaneous to reveal that out loud. How intriguing. Then she is silent and for a moment still is a statue. And she nods almost imperceptibly. Respectfully. He has never spoken to you like this before. He has always made accommodations for you. To impose himself to this degree is unheard of. Oh, yes. Just so we're on the same page. Yeah. One might cut the tension in this room with even a butter knife. Trevor, you came at in impeccable timing. How about we use this and we stretch our legs a bit? We use this... Uh, shall I say, let's put a proposition. I wish to learn more about this mysterious satyr's saturation that has put itself onto these lands in such an un- un- numerous timing. I wish to do some investigating, but I'm afraid I don't want to get myself into much trouble. Uh, I could use some assistance in the mere occupancy of a fellow company if one or Mm. both of you might indulge I think I can do that I mean I'm already in trouble what are they going to do I'm going to get more trouble what they're going to let me off at the next stop that's what I want in the first place jokes on them 
I'm more worried about even getting there in the first place, to be frank. I can take care of myself. Well, not you. I mean, the entire ship has a zoom. I've been trying to read it up on, trying to listen in on some of the conversations going by the workers' deck as well. The saturation is a, an intense moment. Is it not remarkably intriguing how Coast Perch is the only place on the vast continent that, that has this phenomenon? It ain't that intriguing to me, but I, I mean, uh, you know, everywhere you go, there's something special about it, you know, back where I'm from, back where I've been traveling. There's always something notable. You know, this place just got a lot of salt. You know, I don't know what kind of phenomenon you're talking about, but um, if you need me to go out there, give you some backup, that's what I'm here for. I would certainly love the company. How about you, Doctor? You're wrong, Trevor. And she's turned herself back towards the writing desk and she's staring down at whatever she was working on. You can get in more trouble. You and I both can on this boat. The the family you've run afoul of is vicious and petty. And I was right to worry about you and I being separated so quickly and I'm not sure if it's wise for me to leave these quarters, even in your company. It uh, might en- endanger us both. Uh-huh. Since you insist on me speaking our private business aloud. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're the boss. Uh. I understand it. It's okay. I'm not giving you orders, Trevor. No, I get it. There's just, you know, there's a lot going on. I'd be better off if something were to happen, if the other shoe were to drop. It'd be better if we were together. It might not matter, uh, in the end. The end sometimes maybe further than it can be doctor at least in my experience come on lighten the load a little bit i'm sure even you might want to schedule legs oh how about in proposition we'll make it a quick visit and we bring you back some food at least myself i'm quite famished as is now what would you have if you can find a change of clothes for me i'd appreciate that i must smell something awful i'll take anything to eat if god wills it i shall accept that challenge <laughs> Just, Trevor, what was it you said they tried to get off of you? Or out of you? Well, they took me into a room, left me in there for a spell, played some cards with some guys, made some friends with a guy named Ken. I did some work for them, moved some boxes. Then once that was done, I just, I mean, weren't nobody around to tell me what to do no more, so I just did what I want. I came back here. I understand that there's something here, something strange. You don't act, you don't normally act like this. So if you're concerned about me, I suspect you got reason to. If you want me to stay here, I'll stay here. Not just as a worker, but just as like, I don't know, a buddy. And you know that genuinely surprised her. Like she thought, she was cool as a cucumber. <laughs> You're very insightful, Trevor. Uh, perhaps I have just been cooped up too long. Uh, and maybe I should stretch my legs. Lord knows I haven't been doing my stretches that I should be doing. Uh, uh, maybe just a quick jaunt the three of us and uh, we could come back and we could play some cards. We got nothing better to do. Might as well kill some time. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, let's... I think all this time cooped up in here might be... uh... You know what? I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. (laughs) I'm not going (laughs) to talk down on you. Um, 
if you want to go with me, Niles has got his thing. That's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. I'm right behind you either way. And a moment of gratitude flashes over her face. She's really not used to being scared. It's been a while and she's at sea, if you will. Uh, And so she just composes herself and gets her cane and sort of instinctively takes up her her medical bag, like her doctor's bag that she often carries around with her, hands it to you and takes your elbow with her free hand. Shall we, gentlemen? Somewhere else on the ship, somebody else is stepping out of a room in the first class cabin. Again, you walk up the staircase, you find your way to that same hallway and you've done this routine for every outdoor break that you've gotten. And like clockwork, just like the day before and the day before that, almost at exactly the same time, Felix steps out of his room to go grab his plate. And he sees you again this time. Um, what was your name again? Uh, Esper. You gonna catch me every time I leave my room, Esper? Are you going to come out of your room every time I'm walking by? You do a lot of walking. He starts to walk by. Well, Esper, enjoy your walk. Enjoy your food. And for the first time, you notice he doesn't lock the door as he steps out. Would you roll for me an insight check? Sure. That is a 17. You can tell he genuinely forgot as he walks down the hall for his five-minute walk to and from the kitchen. It's hard when you're confined to a babysitter to be distracted by things. And for somebody like Esper, who is normally quite used to a routine, even the micro chance to form a routine on a few days' journey, the fact that that door was not locked suddenly is just screaming at them. So Esper is going to hang back, or rather, they will continue their walk like normal until about the point where Felix's possible line of sight may break, and then Esper will double back to his room door. You get back to the door, and you see it's there. Slowly open it. As you slowly open the door, would you please roll a stealth check? That is a 22 silent and you see a room that is immaculate it's twice the size of yours it bears a king-sized bed it even looks like it might even have multiple rooms within it and you notice two things immediately and one of them startles you the first is there's a man standing in the corner observing a painting and smoking and second There is another man in the other corner, tied to a chair. Uh, Does Esper recognize either of these men? Roll intelligence or history. That is a nine. The one in the chair has some familiarities, but you can't place exactly what they are. The hair is a bit ratty. They look a little bit dirty. And upon observing them, If you don't close the door right away, you'll notice there's red spots, marks where the rope has been digging into their skin for possibly a couple days now. You notice they're also gagged, and they're sitting very quietly. Do they see me? The man who's smoking in front of the painting looks at it for a bit, and he turns to the table in the other direction of you and turns on the radio, turns it up just a bit, and you hear a song come on. He looks like he's about to turn in another direction, but you don't know which. Do you keep this door open to observe? No, I think in in, in them there's like there's going in, there's a the moment of shock, looking at one but then staring at the other, and then the next minute muscle memory just takes them backwards and they shut the door on the other side. The door closes. A couple minutes have gone by, you can tell that any minute Mr. Felix could be returning. Esper has to remember where they would be right now by this time on the ship. So they just walk off 
as they start trying to remember, trying to guide themselves to it. I would say roll a performance check on this, because that is very clever, and give advantage. Eleven. You walk over to the window, where you'd normally have looked out and tried to strain a bit through the fog to see if you could see anything, and you can tell by the time you hear the footsteps on the stairs, you know you can't get quite back to the place where you'd normally be, but you are carefully inspecting the window and paying careful mind to its detail, and as he walks up, you know, you see him stop in front of his door, put the key in, and do the unlock motion, and you're not looking at him, but you can hear the hollow lack of a tumble as he turns the key, a slight pause, and then the key come out of the door, the door opens, and it closes. It's less of a performance and more of a sort of dissociative shock. Esper can only stare out the window. Esper's eyes are painfully focused on the nothing out the window. Realizing and hearing all of those noises, thinking for stretches of moments what is going to happen. But if there is silence, Esper is eventually going to tear themselves from the window and walk back down the hall. You do so, and you walk back down the hall to the seating area. You see Mr. Augie with a cocktail of sorts, holding it with a pinky out, speaking to somebody. Yeah, and, uh, look, I wish I could have gotten quite any other room, but at least, uh, we got to be in the... Oh, uh, hey, Esper. Don't let me stop you. And she's just gonna kind of turn away slowly and walk someplace else for a moment. And then when Esper's out of sight, she's gonna stop and think. And eventually dig into her pocket. Unfold it and look at the paper. And look at the paper and look at the paper. Is there a crew member nearby? There's the uh, bartender who's making cocktails for the wealthy. There's also the kitchen, which people don't actually typically go right into. It serves out of there. There's no guard at the door. Nobody's concerned about you stepping outside because outside is going to kill you. That is, unless you wear a rebreather, that's kind of a decision because people would notice it's gone. Esper's going to climb up onto a bar stool seat. Not near Mr. Augie, though. Hello? Uh, would you like a drink? Um, she's going to hold the paper towards them. I don't know if you can help, but I'm, I need to know where I can find this room. And which room are you referring to on the paper? This is the paper that Dr. Glass had written her room number on. Uh, let's see, um... Uh, yes, that's uh, in the second-class cabin. Unfortunately, access to it is just restricted right now, um, due to the, uh, as the captain has said, the saturation having settled in. And you'll find that... In here, in the first-class cabin, accommodations are much more comfortable. But I... there's somebody I'd, I'd like to find. Well, if you can hold your breath for ten minutes as you go across the deck, um, there is uh, other access, but it's mainly just for crew. Besides, don't you want to be separated from those people? That's why we're here, all of us. Why would I want to be separated from those people when I... I just told you, I want... Where's the crew passage? The, through the kitchen. If you head down the stairs, you'll find your way to the cargo hold. You can walk right across the ship there. But, again, that's just for crew. She, she's already climbing down the stool. Um, you see him lean back for a moment, contemplating what he just said. Kitchen door. Through it. You go through the kitchen door and you see a few chefs working. They don't pay too much mind to you, but you do notice an eye or two noticing you walk through. And you get to the door, the stairs, and you walk down to the storage rooms. You could make your way all the way across the ship towards that room. Decidedly not stopping. No, Esper has a mission right now. You get to the room and... Trevor, uh, Dr. Glass, and Nihilus von Stonen. 
As you open the door to your room to step out into the hall, you feel the door hit something. <laughs> uh, Esperanza, you don't get hit by the door hard, but it opens when you least expected it to. And with your hands in front of you, you bump into it. Hold on, something's in there. Let me put my back into it. <laughs> Shove it. This works because there was momentum behind it, so Esper's definitely stumbling in the hall. Oh. Oh. Oh, my. If we reach ashore. Trevor. Hello? <laughs> yeah, Trevor pokes his head out. First, he's got it at eye level. It's like, what? Oh. What? Pigman. Hey. <laughs> she's got this paper in her hand, and immediately upon seeing Dr. Glass, she's like, yes, yes. H- hello. Hello again, dear. Are you all right? I got the right room. Yes, you did. Well done. And she just kind of checks her, her forehead and her pupils and a very entitled but doctorly man. You know, she just put puts her hand on her immediately. You seem to be well known, Doctor. Uh, I believe I told you that when we met, but I'm glad you're catching on, Nihilus. You'll be a fine scholar someday. Are you all right, dear? Esper's like looking up at two strangers, but really it's three strangers, but still Dr. Glass is a face that she's somewhat familiar with now. Are you, are you bored? Rarely. Any of I me? usually keep my mind quite occupied. A boredom would be an exquisite luxury. I found something. Oh, I'm even less bored now. What did you find? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know anybody on this ship, and the person who is set to look after me is a boring fuck, and I don't want to talk to him either. Oh, yes. I was on my walk, and he left the door unlocked, so I, I couldn't help it. I'm bored. I peek, and I saw someone who's been tied up in a chair. Oh, my. You seem to be having a rather... Romantic evening, then. Yes, which kind? I don't think it's... F- no, no, not... Not like that. All right, all right. He's been there, like, a while. Like, the ropes were really getting into his skin. What about that? And Dr. Glass turns... Yeah, Dr. Glass turns to Nihilus and says, at the very least, that is bad practices. <laughs> Heard about that as well. Um, Everyone knows you shouldn't leave them for longer than 20 minutes. This man's definitely been left for longer than 20 minutes. Uh, you said he left it on... Where is this? First class? Of course. Sure, there must be some sort of misunderstanding. Are you sure of what you saw? I opened the door. It was a large room. I think they call them suites here. I, yes. And there was a man staring at a painting. I don't know what he has to do with it. You... And then in the other corner, snooty fucker has a man tied to a chair. Oh. You seem to be in a bit of distress. Is it distress? Or am I f- finding something to do for the first time in a few days? I hope it's distress and not just a figment of bored imagination. Uh, I can't really tell, well, to be honest. I know the way. Back up. Um, we just have to take the cruise quarters. But Snooty Fuck has a man tied in a chair. You hear the kick of the vents in the room? Kick for a moment, but then you don't hear the wind blowing this time. It seems... I didn't even realize your air wasn't on. It just kind of flips on and off. Um, all right, so apparently you're here, right? And you're here because you got a problem? Well, there's a problem up there. Uh, you need us? We'll come with. Yes, Absolutely. It, Dr. Glass would just like to give her a once over because she knows a little bit of Esperance's history. Just, uh, is she on drugs? Roll a medicine check. Where is the button? There we go. 19. You hear the vent kick again. But again, no air comes out. And as you look over Esperanza, you can tell that she's medicated and she is on something, but she looks well managed and she looks like she could be at the appropriate dosage. And just like that, you hear an announcement come over. Please, if you are outside of your rooms, enter them right away. This is very urgent that you all enter your rooms right away. It's a standard procedure, nothing to be alarmed about. And you hear the voice of Captain Ogram Strand. That might be the sound of our window closing, I'm afraid. We're gonna go, we gotta do it now. I have a- I have a room. I... I don't... I don't... Well, I've seen you once, 
big man, but I haven't seen you before pointing to Nihilus. Uh, but I've already said it, so I suppose you're all in on it. That sounded to me like an invitation to first class, and I accept. Let's shelter with Ms. Say we were to be on a walk, and we were to proposition to safely bring each other to our corresponding rooms in a bit of a divergent route. I got lost, and you're bringing me back. Exactly. There you go. Look at that. You're, you're, you're a doctor. <laughs> you, you said you were a doctor. Shall we? Let's go. Yes, this is... Uh, by the way, I'm Nihilus, as we proceed. Ah, uh, Esper. Esper. Uh, Trevor. It's just Trevor. Big man Trevor. Let's go. You head down the halls, and the way you came, Esper, and Trevor, you'll recognize this room. It heads right down to the storage deck. Now, as you're walking down the hall towards that stairwell, you recognize the assistant to the captain is walking adjacent, in a different direction. Not through the, quite the same hall, a different one. You notice through the little alleyways that are between the two of them. You see the assistant to the captain stop. He notices you and turns down the alleyway. Oh, good, good. Exactly the ones I was looking for. We needed a hand, and Trevor, I, you wouldn't mind a bit of a dangerous job, would you? Uh, well, I, I was I was just about to do a thing. Um, you know, what, what, what do you need? Well, whatever that thing is, I'll promise you it's not nearly as important as this thing. The heartbeat of the ship. Uh, the uh, ventilation system that keeps all of us alive. Um, it is not running. Oh, dear. Oh, so like, that's bad. Uh... It's very bad, yes. I was hoping to find you because uh, in order to access it, it, it's through the outside. And, and he leans in and we know given the situation that you might be the best one if it's a dangerous job given what's waiting for you at the island. So, you know I'm not good at, like, engineering stuff, right? Well, this has happened before, and typically it's just a clog. Realistically, we probably have several hours before there's any noticeable concerns among the deck. It could be less. I'm not quite sure, because we've not experienced this before. You hear a stammer in his voice, and he actually starts, you starts to break a bit in how panicked he is. And we just need somebody to go down now. I do have crews that I was going to go and ask for help, but I think you might be the best man for the job. Somehow, I, I'm not sure if that's the case, but... Um... We also need somebody, just in case, who has some sort of learnedness, because we don't have our engineer on board. That's why I remembered your name, too, Dr. Glass. Uh, Dr. Glass, whose head had whipped to Trevor on the... given what's waiting for you on the island, looks back at this fellow, bewildered. I think it's good for optics. Right. Yeah. Fine. You'd like my employee and I you'd like a bodyguard and a psychoanalyst to go fix the ship we left port without our engineer because we've not needed them any month out of the year except that of the saturation and this has never happened before and how much would you have paid the engineer quite a considerable sum during the saturation, they are the most oh, important good. member. Oh, good. I knew you weren't, uh... Oh, I... Using I'm not my asking employee for, for free. free. No, of course not. We're willing to pay the same sum we pay our engineer if this can simply be resolved. To each of us, lovely. Uh, you uh, will also be giving Trevor a rebreather, right? Of course. A rebreather? I we, won't. We have several... Seven here in the second class, two in the first class, and several more in storage. Just in storage? Again, this is months earlier than the saturation has ever happened. Don't know how else to tell you that 
we're in unfortunate circumstances. A dire need indeed. And you see he's sweating. He's not put together. His clothes are a little bit rustled. I I get it. Okay, fine. They don't... He kind of says this aside to himself uh, so that people close can hear it. It's just They want me because I'm expendable. It's fine. I'm used to that. Well, I'm not. They need to know that. And you're not they expendable. They need to know. Doc, they need to know that I'm not difficult. That's why. <sighs> Again, Trevor, you are wise. Uh, it would most certainly be a boon to your situation as already is. I'm afraid that the man does speak certain truth. How some of the houses do have their certain views on certain things. I'm sorry for putting it like that. Yeah, and it would and be good too. Do keep in mind, if you fail, we might all lose our lives. Well, that's very true, but don't let him hear that. You're costing us our leverage, Nihilus. Then she smiles at the assistant. Kind of looking down to Asper. Uh, sorry. Uh, I didn't get... I didn't get your name. Uh, Esperanza. Cool. Uh, Esper. E- Esper. Uh, I'm just gonna... I'm gonna keep going with him. Uh, you continue your thing. Uh, make sure... Make sure that you get a rebreather. I took one breath of that stuff outside and it was... No, don't do it. It's significantly worse now. We must breathe it oh. when it was early on and only stung a bit. Now if you breathe it, if not for just a few breaths, well, it will fill your lungs with salt in an instant. Doctor. No longer invigorating to the curls. The axe as hatched to the ship's mechanicals, unfortunately, is outside. This is an old ship that's been well adapted to the saturation, but was not built with it in mind originally. Uh, perhaps, why don't you, why don't you gentlemen go and I, I might accompany this young person to th- their cabin since they were lost. And, and got a bit of a clock on the bean. Uh, which I might be able to help with as a doctor. (laughs) She just dangles her bag. Right. Good luck to you guys. Uh, Buddy, uh, what's your name? I don't care. Uh, Lead me to uh, wherever so I can do whatever. Yeah, uh, of course. I shall follow. He leads you to one of the doors out to the decks one of the private ones for crew. And next to it, you see three rebreathers. He takes two of them, and they're heavy devices. Massive, even. There's tanks that wrap around to a backpack that goes onto your back, and there's a large mask that goes onto your face, and when it's on, visibility is significantly worse. But, and he says, with these devices, you'll be able to breathe for several minutes. Um, you have to get to the hatch, turn the lever, which would require, and he taps on, uh, Trevor's arm, uh, some strength, nothing that somebody like you can't handle, and then simply make your way down after closing the hatch. The last air support to go would be the first class cabin, but before that would be the engine room where this thing operates. As you can tell, the air is probably already seeming thin here as the the vent kicks on again with no air coming out. Uh, right, so fast. Fast is what you're asking for. Right now. And he takes the rebreather off of the wall and puts it around your back. And in the meantime, Dr. Glass, you're left alone with Esper. And Before I, they depart, though, can she turn to to the boys and and say very quietly uh, in a whisper that reaches both their ears in normal language? Thank you for taking care of us. Let me, in turn, take care of both of you. And they both have bardic inspiration. 
As Nihilus continues to walk forward and he puts both of his hands behind his back, a little bit how sometimes a priest would walk into his church uh, after hearing that and perhaps feeling that, there's suddenly a thumbs up as he walks and you would see. <clears throat> so, left alone, yes. You are with Esper and you're heading, I suppose, with her back to the first class cabin. And you do so. You walk through the storage room, up to the stairs, up through the kitchen. But, Dr. Glass, you're familiar with the noble life. And as you step in, you can immediately recognize a cocktail party when you see one, or at least something like that. You see several people standing there talking and mingling. And you do vaguely recognize Mr. Augie, whose face is very familiar, as he's been an assistant to several proficient psychologists in the past, but maybe just his name would come to mind. Anyway, he's talking to somebody in the corner, and you don't see his attention turning on you also. What are you two doing? Uh, if there is no deviance to the plan, Esper is going to be leading Dr. Glass back to Esper's room. Just hold this a moment, dear, and she gives uh, Esper her bag just so she can snag a cocktail off a tray. Like, bear hugging it. She doesn't slow down. She just takes the cocktail with her. Get to the room, and as you open it, you notice the accommodations are significantly more lavish. The sheets are silk. There's paintings on the wall. There's two desks to accommodate two beds. And plenty of breathing room between both of them. And, most notably, it is cool and comfortable and... The air is fresh. Perhaps we can introduce your handler to Nihilus and they can hit it off. And you and I could be roommates. Wouldn't that be lovely? Oh, that'd be wonderful. Mr. Augie's a fucking prick. I am a doctor, after all. Perhaps I can convince him you need my constant care and supervision. I mean, that would really work out in my favor. I mean, if you're willing to... Look into the man in the chair sometime with me, if that's an interest of you at all. Oh, make no mistake, I, I am extremely intrigued. I love a scandal, especially with rich people involved. Especially a kinky scandal, which this definitely appears to be. You hear another announcement come across the PA system. This is the final call. Rooms will be checked Doors will be knocked. All must settle in. I think... I think you might have to go back. I I hope there was going to be more time, but if they're going to be checking rooms... What are they going to do to me? Throw me off? At this point, let them. I, I mean, you're better conversation than... Prick man back there. If you want to stay, I'm not going to make you leave. Good. And neither shall they. I'm not going anywhere. I'm finishing this drink. And we're going to hatch some plans around this fellow tied to a chair. Somewhere else on the ship, Trevor, the assistant of the captain, tightens the belt of this machine that gets strapped to your back. It's a very crude device, but he promises it's effective. And he then goes over, Nihilus, I'm sure you've already swung it over your back as well and did most of the work while he was assisting Trevor, but he looks, uh, looks you over. Yes, uh, looks perfectly well done. Um, I would just tighten this. Goes over and he grabs one of the belts and <laughs> cinches it. Good. We can't have you losing it while you're outside. This is your only lifeline. Uh, I won't be able to see you, nor will anybody. It's your job to find this hatch. I have to keep the doors barricaded here. I have to. Because if something were to happen, then the door would swing open and compromise the vessel, and especially where there's little air. We can't have that happen. You can knock, but let's just say it's best you find the hatch and get this done with. It's right in the middle of the ship. Straight out the door. You walk straight. You can't miss it. Uh straight ahead straight cool uh i can do that uh all right uh anything to do that it, like if these rebreathing thingies if we 
run out, run out of air, or if, if these things go on the fritz, anything we can do, or is that it? Is that curtains? Well, there's an emergency canister. See this here, this, this, um, this string. If you pull that, it'll release the emergency canister and give you another, perhaps a minute, if that. But it's in case of an emergency to give you just a bit more time. Nice. Okay. Um, I do have a question. Uh, it is so incredibly thick, this whole, this whole s- s- saturation. Uh, how, what do we use for sight in order to proceed further? Are we just walking in blindly? Or are there tips, methods, any last bits of information that be helpful? Now would be the time, please. Yes, we have a, a, a routine. He goes over and hands you a stick. It is actually a stick. It's not even anything, you know, professional. He says, this is a stick. Well, uh, there is a bump in the ground. You can use it to follow the bump. That ridge leads you straight to the hatch. It is still straight, but it'll help you from falling off course. Right. Stick. Cool. Uh... Guess I'll just crude solution, but it does the job. Yeah, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll figure it out. I we're a couple of smart fellers, you know. We, we can. Uh, I don't propose to mm, much. Figure it out. Yes, <sighs> we will have to. I don't suppose there'll be much winds. Shall we put a rope tied to one another, Tr- dear Trevor? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, you got rope? In my quarters. Yes. I I yes. have rope. It's part of oh. our common supplies. And he takes Marvelous. it out of one of the boxes and hands it over. Uh, Trust Would you me. like the remarkable invention of the stick? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll take the lead on this. Might as well. Uh, all right. Just, um, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Now I'm good. Just, I'm not sh- sure if you're, myself up. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're a man of God yourself, but would you like to join me in a quick prayer? Man, I'll take all the help I can get. Hmm. As Nihilus holds his cross and he holds out, out open his hand, like a welcomed palm, he closes his eyes, and there's this sense of aura that changes in him for just a slight moment. He prays out loud and says, Dear Testimonium, please ever have your teachings and your faithful guidance approach us further into the troubles that are to come. That it be a quick and never and fortunate aid that we can provide for all that need. And he casts bless as concentration on himself and on Trevor. This is not a flashy, a magical, a bims, a bam. It is not even much of a feeling, except for it is almost as if when one speaks, you have the understanding that someone hears your words without even saying a thing. This is like a layer of affection that falls upon you. Uh, and, uh, if you're listening, uh, ditto for me too, what he said. Um, Shall we? Right. Let's, let's do it. Get her done. The assistant to the captain pulls a crate away from the door. It's a light one. The door latch this time seems to work fine. He unlatches it and holds the door closed for a moment. Both of you, believe me when I say, I, the captain, the entire crew and all of its passengers are quite grateful to you. Well, thank me when I get back. (laughs) Of course. And with that, he opens the door. There's a thrust of cold wind that starts to blow at you. The salt is is biting at your skin like sand from a beach on a on a windstorm. It's harsh, 
can't see anything. <sighs> All right. Forward, right? I'm going. Forward. Straight just ahead. Takes a stick and just starts, like, sweeping across. <laughs> Not unlike a blind man trying to find his way down the pavement. Should be mechanical of nature. Metal. It's all metal. It's a ship. The stick hits the ridge on the side, on the right, just where he said it would be. And the wind batters you. You feel like it could topple you over if you weren't a stronger person. And you follow this ridge across what feels like a very long deck. It felt a lot shorter when you walked across and you could see something, but with every step, it feels like you're going quite a distance. And finally, as this stick bumps against a piece of metal in front of you. You can't see it, but you know you've hit something. Okay. Uh, hold on. Hold on. I think I got... Uh, he's gonna drop down to his knees, and he's just gonna start feeling around the floor. Did you find it? Maybe. Roll perception with disadvantage. Alright. Perception disadvantage plus a d4 and guard it I don't know if I want to use that just yet the bless Uh, is sadly not for check just so you know it's not for checks oh it's okay well uh, then maybe I will use that uh, bardic inspiration then Uh, d6 correct well you don't have to use it in advance bardic you can declare after yeah uh, yes, 56. Okay, so with a four on the inspiration, that would make it an 11. You feel around, and it's all metal. It's just all metal. Your hands touching everywhere they can. It's smooth, it's domed, but time is going by, and you don't find a handle or anything. It's just a solid surface. Hold on, hold on. No, we're good. No, 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 this, this ain't it. This ain't the hatch. Uh, I think we got turn around. Hold on. Turn around? He kind of starts breathing heavier. I felt the rope duck down. Did you fall? As you breathe in just a little bit heavier, you feel something in your mechanism break loose, and you hear <laughs> as clearly air is starting to leak. No, 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 no. We gotta go now. You feel like you can still breathe a little bit, but it's getting thinner and thinner, and it's going to be gone in seconds. Immediately pulling that uh, emergency tank and see if anything happens, because that's all he learned. Like, if if it's a leak in the hose, that's probably going to go out too, but he's a dummy. So he's going to pull the cord on the emergency. You pull it, and you notice there was no pull to it. It comes right off. Shit, where are we? We gotta, we gotta go now. Nihilus. Yes, yes, it should be at the center. We should be close to it. Any... It's just split up. Remember from where we entered. Split up. Yeah, we can follow each other's voices. Just we can cover more ground. Alright, alright, alright. I'll take left, you take right. Sure. Sure. I'm feeling around. <laughs> Nihilus, please roll perception with disadvantage. For a total of three after a natural one. You walk away, letting loose the rope around your waist, I assume? Or are you staying within range of that? He let go of the rope. You go away and you find what's, what feels like on the wall. First, something rigid, something round. You can trace your hand around it, and you feel it a little more closely, and you put your hand and you kind of drag it across, and you notice it's glass. This is a porthole. It's not a hatch. It's, it's not here. We have to keep looking. Ugh. Yeah. Keep going. <sighs> He's, he's now focusing on how deep he's breathing, and it's been a while since he's focused on this. Every breath feels like a knife in his chest. And he's just like, even before he starts running out of air, 
It's just going. It's here. It's here. It's gotta be here. Just please hurry. Roll perception with disadvantage again, please, Trevor. As you take what you can tell is the last breath out of the machine. Uh, you have to hold your breath after that. It's a 15. You feel around and you bump your way back into that same mound, that smooth metal dome surface. And as you move your hand slightly above, you notice there's a wheel on it of some kind. It's set, it feels like it could be the wheel that would turn and open a hatch. It was just a little bit further up and not dead center. It was beyond surprising you with its location, which is why you didn't find it the first time. Yeah. Whatever, like, even if it was to, like, a door or uh, a porthole or something to get him to open, as soon as he grabbed onto the wheel, he just starts turning it uh, to get it open. He realizes he doesn't have much air left, and he's just desperate at this point. You pull as harshly as you can on this wheel. You feel it. It's a heavy door. There's no doubt about it. It's probably the heaviest on the ship. It's one that does not get opened very often. And I think this is a good chance to take our break. 